What's better, flu or school? Not an easy question. Neither are pleasant, but at least with the flu you generally get left alone and don't have to do sums. And essentially immobilised and housebound, you get access to a strange new world called the daytime. Mostly accessible through the television, you could, if you were strong enough to peer through your symptoms, glimpse the things that people did to entertain themselves during the hours most people were drudging, either at school or work. If you timed it right, you could get a glimpse of an even stranger hidden dimension of programmes that weren't even intended to be seen. But generally during these hours, before they were colonised by chit-chat and property shows, it was schools programming. Of course you were probably familiar with it from actual school. Either a big old Ferguson set was wheeled into class importantly on a trolley, followed by five to ten minutes of faffing around trying to make it work, or else you'd be led out, naturally in crocodile formation, to your school's special screening room, on which another Ferguson sat on a dais like a Buddha. Ours was called the Jubilee Room, because it was opened in 1977. That was how to watch it without a fever, except maybe one induced by boredom. At school, you got what you were shown. Trapped at home with a bucket and a gallon of Lucozade, you got to see the full spectrum of educational programming from mad pantomimes intended to explain basic arithmetic to relatively full body drama serials, occasionally interrupted by lectures on what words mean by an orange abomination. Or just incredibly dull voices droning over grainy East Macara stock footage. With pretty patterns and occasionally random imagery in between, just to keep your feverish mind interested. A dreamlike parallel universe of utility broadcasting. However it was viewed, out of context through a veil of sickness or as intended in stultifying boredom, it was, and what's left of it remains, unique. programming in the UK began in the 1950s. There had already been schools radio since 1929, two years after the BBC incorporated, so it just seemed like an obvious thing to do with the technology. The BBC initially toyed idly with the notion, putting out a few experimental closed circuit broadcasts in 1952, tinkering and pottering as they were wont to do when they were the only game in town and therefore had no reason to hurry that didn't last much longer. Barely a year into ITV's existence, the London franchisee Associated Rediffusion were planning a series of schools broadcast of their own. Unfortunately for them, the BBC still owned or supplied most of the equipment and initially refused to cooperate, but the die was cast. Rediffusion supplied 200 TV sets to schools in the London area. 57, the first school's television program in Britain went out to the capital's wide-eyed kiddies. It was a humanities thing called looking and seeing. None of it survives, obviously, as it went out once live 66 years ago. The BBC launched theirs with a new school year in September 1957, gritting their teeth the whole time and insisting that ITV beating them to it had nothing to do with it. Again, they supplied a few hundred schools with sets, concentrating initially on grammar schools and secondary moderns, and having hired a former headmistress as chief of the new TV schools department, settled in to watch the industry grow. Which it did. Soon it was regular and bountiful enough to need a special identity, which was provided in 1960 by a sort of test card with a pie chart design, and the plumbly functional name for the schools. After 1965, for schools and colleges. And so the cottage industry grew. As more and more regions were added to the ITV network, their service expanded until it too was fully national, with programmes coming from all four corners of the country. Theoretically, at least. In practice, most ITV schools programmes inevitably came from the bigger companies 
Rediffusion and later Thames, Granada, Yorkshire and ATV or Central. The dominance of the big companies was, as you'd expect, even more pronounced in this lower dimension than it was in the prime time world. Until 1972, the government still controlled broadcasting hours, and both the BBC and ITV were only allowed to broadcast for seven hours a day. Almost unthinkable in this day and age. Of course, that seven hours only covered real programmes. The unlisted ghostly likes of engineering announcements and Monday's newcomers didn't count. And there was also a special dispensation for schools programmes to broadcast out of those seven. It had to be, really. This was largely before VCRs, of course. And the trick was to get the whole thing set up and the kids quiet and gawping right when the programme began. Hence the enduring format of having long gaps in between programmes so they could start at a precise advertised time. Initially they were shown after lunch when the kids were generally nodding off tummies full of tuck. But after 1972, when the government relaxed their grip to the point that ITV could start putting real programmes on in the afternoon, they were moved up to the morning, when they were more fidgety and irritable, which I'm sure the teachers really appreciate. So on the BBC you'd get extended longers with a pie chart and some light music, or alternatively just empty forbidding silence. Once into the final minute, the pie chart would start disappearing, being eaten away by a clock counting down the seconds to the programme start itself, as a way of alerting the teacher that this was their last chance to get the kids to shut up before the show started and they could sneak off for a cigarette. ITV used a similarly test card styled slide in the early 70s, which inevitably reminds one of ATV, especially when it's followed by the ATV ident. <laughs> It wouldn't have been directly though. ITV2 gave the teachers that one minute warning complete with countdown clock. Like that ATV ident, it's quite clearly designed to show off television's all new capacity for colour. The previous black and white version emphasised the word school, as if to hammer home to the kids that there is no escape. Eventually ITV tired of the test card style and started filling the space with various interesting images, usually with a different theme each term. There were poetry quotes over nature photography, stylized sports imagery, medieval tapestries, dentist waiting room style watercolours, maps and scrolls, philately, and hardcore pornographic sex, apart from that last one. All accompanied by some variation on the catchy legend independent television for schools and colleges. Several terms used selections from the National Exhibition of Children's Art, which started something of a trend. For those really long pauses, Yorkshire Television provided Picture Rock, an endlessly vertically scrolling loop of pictures drawn by students of various primary schools in Bradford or Leeds or Huddersfield or wherever. Over on the BBC, things were slightly more formal. In 1973, with the advent of schools programmes in colour, the pie chart was dropped and replaced with one of the most intricate, complicated and eerie mechanical model lidents ever broadcast, the infamous BBC Schools Diamond. That's right, this unsettling piece of animated op art is a mechanical model. It definitely feels like you're being brainwashed, like something out of the Ipcris file. One of these surprises has never been used as conspiracy fodder by angry Daily Mail types, accusing the BBC of trying to hypnotise the nation's school kids into sitting down and shutting up. I wouldn't be at all surprised if a frame-by-frame -frame analysis revealed the words Don't see the fnords embedded in the animation for one hundredth of a second. Well, here's a remake in Flash, remember that? By the legendary Dave Jeffrey. He had to effectively reverse engineer the original model to make this, so a paraphrase of his description is probably best. So first of all you've got a base made of three illuminated chevrons, like this. They would show up in either blue or gold depending on the year, and on top of that is a transparent plastic roller with black strips painted on 
that looks like this. Where the blue bits, remember, are transparent, so when it's rolled horizontally over the base, it does this. So you see what the bit where it unexpectedly disintegrates into smaller diamonds was about, opposing chevrons crossing over each other. After that, it was a case of mirroring it down the middle to make a diamond and electronically adding the colours. The whole sequence took two minutes. And as a way of counting down the last 120 seconds so the teacher can get the kids settled, but it was a little on the abstract side of things. Despite how complex a model it was, they only used it for three years before going with something more straightforward from 1977. A circle of vanishing dots accompanied by a full-fledged schools and colleges logo for the first time. Originally, that rotated too, but it wasn't supposed to. The mechanical model was just a bit wonky. They fixed it by spring term. And this basic look, or variations thereupon, settled in for the next six years on BBC One. Programme slides accompanied by library music, anything from Keith Mansfield KPM Muzak to classical selections, to their field choices like the now legendary Bart by Tom Fogarty and Ruby, followed by the countdown in dots. Until 1983. Breakfast television became a thing earlier that year, and with it came the promise of fully-fledged daytime broadcasting. Or the potential for it, anyway. Either way, it seemed like a good idea for BBC One to divest itself of these school's broadcasts, so the space was kept clear when the go-ahead did come. So schools and colleges transferred to BBC Two, where it gained the umbrella title Daytime on Two in the listings pages, although it was never used on screen. The dots didn't survive the journey. Instead, after the extended follow shortly captions, programmes were introduced by an occasionally seen variant on the then incumbent BBC Two worm ident, with a burnt orange background, because daytime. In the event, BBC One didn't get an ongoing daytime service until 1986, but at least they were ready. That same year, BBC Two rebranded to the unloved TWO logo, and all bets were off. Daytime on Two now looks identical to the rest of the day on Two, apart from consisting solely of schools programmes separated by extended longers. The only concession was the occasional use of a digital countdown in the corner of the screen, and that only ever counted down from 15. VCRs were a thing by now, you see. Schools are expected to record these things rather than watch them live. No need to give them a whole two minute warning when they could just use the pause button. This is where the BBC essentially leaves the narrative of schools presentation, at least for a while. When the TWO was replaced with the Bladed 2 in 1991, nothing much changed. Schools programmes continued to be introduced by the usual IDETs. And with broadcasting for VHS now the standard, the extended follow shortly pauses largely vanished as well, with the few rare occasions of dead air generally being filled by public information films or other forms of filler. Even the countdown clock was abandoned. So instead, let's hop across back to ITV land, where the system of interesting slides, occasional picture rolls and blue and white clock had stayed in place until 1987 when ITV also took up daytime television. After all, it hadn't hurt the BBC any, and unlike them, ITV stood to make money out of it. So once again, the school's programmes were shoved out of the way onto the sister station, which in this case, of course, was Channel 4, only five years old at a time. This, of course, prompted a graphical regeneration, and a comprehensive one at that. 30 years of school's education. Now we focus on the future. From the 14th of September, we move to Channel 4. The 
same time, the same days, the same great ITV school service, but all on four. Stand by for ITV schools. went the random art or nature shots, in came a sleek, vaguely alien CGI dreamscape of rotating ITV logos and the same two pieces of music. The main one was called The Journey and lasted six minutes in total, although it was entirely loopable and besides the gaps between programs weren't often that long in the first place. The other was called Just a Minute, for obvious reasons, and ran over the newfangled clock, another CGI creation which was so subtle that sitting at the back of the classroom and squinting at it on a 625 line Ferguson set, I never even noticed it was a clock at all. But it was. Both tunes were composed by James Oldenham, who is a pseudonym for Brian Bennett, Hank Marvin's former drummer. Slightly confusingly, they didn't change the name. The service remained ITV Schools, even though it was on Channel 4. It made more sense than it looked to baffled kids like me, and almost no one else. It really was still ITV schools. The ITV companies made the programming, the ITV network still ran the service, it was just the airwaves that were provided by Channel 4. <laughs> Of course, there was another Channel 4 in Wales, because Wales has to be awkward. Not only that, but they naturally had the old Welsh language schools programmes, or rather as Gullion. So they got this variation on the spinning logos with their own, in place of ITV, which is more than the Sysnake Channel 4 ever got. This metallic ITV schools look became instantly iconic to the late 80s, early 90s generation of school kids. It was futuristic and hyper-modern, but also cold and alien. Where the previous aesthetic of nature photography, stylized watercolours or little kids' fridge art portrayed some sort of human point of origin, this look was hard, if not impossible, to relate to human beings. It was much easier to believe that there was some kind of giant computer in Charlotte Street spitting these things out. But it was at the age of six anyway. Still, cold and mechanical it might have been, but it was definitely memorable, as evidenced by the fact that it remains iconic to my generation to this day, despite only lasting six years. In 1993, as part of the sweeping reforms to commercial television, the umbilical cord tying Channel 4 to ITV was cut, and the fourth channel became 100% its own company for the first time. This, of course, did not mean that ITV would take schools programming back. Instead, it finally took on the Channel 4 branding thoroughly, with a whole new look that actually managed to be even eerier and more alien than the previous one. I will go to my grave wondering why they decided on this particular aesthetic chilly and ambient, flickering impressionistic visuals and a strangely oceanic sound, what with the whale song and the radar blips permeating the music by Andy Carroll and Nick Moore. Those ideas must have taken a while to put together with the flashing lights, careful blocking and positioning, and some images only are visible for a fraction of a second. They are undeniably creepy, especially the one that ends with Beethoven staring at you, but brilliantly made and thought up. Not one mind in a thousand could even have conceived them, let alone put them together and got them to work more or less perfectly. The rest of the package was good too, with recording very much the inescapable standard method by now, there were fewer long pauses, 
The countdown clock was now a simple countdown from 30, if that. Anything longer was covered by the gallery, a throwback to Yorkshire's picture roll, only the kiddies' paintings weren't glued to a bit of toilet roll and cranked in front of the camera this time. The Channel 4 schools of the mid-90s was equally alien as its ITV school's predecessor, but in a different way. If I may paraphrase my own dang self, the silvery industrial brushed chrome ITV schools could feel like it was run by a heartless machine. Its successor, enigmatic and even faintly nightmarish, felt more like it was run by the aliens from Close Encounters. Unknowable and capable of communicating solely in bleeps, but essentially benevolent. That's apart from Welsh kids, of course, who had their own S4C as Golio. It was very good as well, though. S4C were dragon-obsessed at the time, quite rightly, thanks to a Lambinan rebrand that also extended to this terrific fire-and-skill clockwork dragon thing, with a sort of inverted countdown. Usually the dots disappear on these things. Here it's all about construction rather than deconstruction except when they needed more time and were sent off for another go-round. Quite often the Welsh programme ran short than whatever was occupying the same slot in the rest of the country. Sadly, despite the considerable effort must have been put in, the strange ambient Channel 4 schools look only lasted a few years. In October 1996, Channel 4 changed its idents and indeed its entire visual identity for the first time, and their school service followed dutifully on. Hello and welcome to Monday Morning with Channel 4 Schools. Not long to wait now, we're at the bus stop with Geography Junction. With a new look involving connecting circles, it wasn't a huge leap of imagination to translate that into a sort of spark of education type thing being passed around from kid to kid before finally prodded onto the screen to create the logo. Get a dozen or so stage school kids down to Horse Free Road, drape some black curtains around the corner of an unused office suite, and you're done inside eight hours. And of course, I'm obliged to mention that one of those stage school kids was a tiny Billy Piper two years later would inexplicably be at number one in the pop charts. Remember that? When Billy Piper was this teeny bop pop star? Life is stupid. By now these are just regular ride dates, complete with continuity announcements. Now on for Jeremy Iron stars in the powerful play Mirad, a boy from Bosnia, the English programme. Anyway, S4C didn't rebrand, logo adjustment notwithstanding, so their Clockwork Dragon continued its service until 1999. That year, Channel 4 rebranded again, this time to boxes and stripes on a flat plane. So again, the new school's look was fairly easy to reach. Now on Schools, our geographical eye over Asia reveals India's renowned textile industry. S4C2 decided to make a change, apparently influenced by the fact that widescreen television was a thing now, and the Clockwork Dragon had only been filmed in 4-3. So out he went in favour of a flying mosaic of whales being beautiful, albeit in black and white, with another dragon image underneath, this time in flames and revealed in all his glory at the end. Both the BBC and Channel 4 were starting to chafe at this public service obligation by now, however. They wanted real morning programmes too. By the turn of the century, there was no practical reason for school's television to run during school hours at all. Any school that didn't have a VCR in 1999 had more problems than were the broadcaster's business to solve. 24-hour television was an established thing by now. It didn't take a series of mega-maths to solve the equation. The BBC had already experimented with the idea. The 
overnight educational programming was already something they were used to thanks to the Open University. In 1993, they launched Night School TV on post-closed down BBC Two. You're watching BBC Two. Where various educational programs were put in blocks, sometimes of a complete series, one after the other alongside higher education and even trade programs aimed at the teachers themselves. It even had its own IDEN for some reason that was only ever used to introduce one program strand that went out at two in the morning. I think they just liked making these IDENs, which is fine by me. Night School's title sequence was much more... Uh, inscrutable. All the ASCII owl, the avant-garde melody dodging music, the lack of identifying information such as the word night school appearing on screen. Not that I'm criticising, this is exactly the sort of thing that should be on in the middle of the night. Unsettling, cryptic, implacable and uncompromising. Something that you don't understand and it's not going to help you. Night School TV obviously worked out. It was in 1995 the BBC launched The Learnings of This time it was serious. BBC Two wanted some daytime action, goddammit. Learning Zone ran weekly from half past twelve, or two on Mondays, through the night until 7am. The standard open university shows now rubbed shoulders with actual schools programs. Some of them anyway. And unlike the night school TV experiment, it wasn't as convenient multipacks. This was their new home, permanently, albeit gradually. By 1999, all the secondary and above programming had moved overnight. The BBC had regenerated by then, of course, and in the process, the Learning Zone gained its own identity separate from BBC Two, the famous acorn-based motif. It's a lovely ident, and probably represents the last knockings of abstract in-camera fire and skill ident design before everything went all cinema verite in the early 21st century. The bespoke Philip Glass string ensemble tune got a bit wearying after a while though, not to say 16 years, which is how long the learning zone lasted with the same idents the whole time, actually a record. There was one other place schools programming could be found, the CBBC channel of all places. This was part of the deal when the channel was created, it had to contribute something towards the old public service remit, hence Class TV, where the channel stopped being fun for a few hours in the morning, around about the old date home on two hours in fact, in order to show repeats of watch or words and pictures or bite-sized revision guides. Meanwhile, on Channel 4, mistakes were being made. Specifically, in 2001, their schools programming was transferred over to their commercial arm, the now defunct Four Ventures. This made a lot of people very angry and was widely regarded as a bad move. Schools programming was and is fairly obviously part of the public service remit that Channel 4 still has, despite certain best efforts. But now it was part of the for-profit branch of the company. Suddenly they were expected to make money. Inevitably, quality control at the newly renamed For Learning went for a burden, culminating in the infamous Teen Big Brother. Yes, that was under For Learning auspices. You can look it up for yourself if you really want to. 
The fury over that caused them to butt their ideas up somewhat until the whole enterprise was finally sold off in 2007 to form a separate company that retains the Channel 4 name and association but is essentially wholly independent. Meanwhile, the traditional morning school slot had long since been vacated in favour of the middle of the night, until by the early teens it was gone. Around the same time, the BBC finally moved those school's programmes that remained on the erstwhile daytime on two, mostly repeats of the likes of Number Time and Look and Read, into the learning zone. And an era quietly ended. It ended even more definitively in 2015, when the corporation announced that due to the government's increasing resentment of the BBC having any money at all, the learning zone was being wound up to save a few pounds. Everyone had the internet by now anyway, and most of the BBC's educational provision could be found there instead, and still can, with their comprehensive bite-sized service. Ultimately, school's programmes didn't die, they simply and inevitably became obsolete. Or, if your glass is half full, they evolved into the internet-based mixed media we have today, mostly from the BBC. Study guides, browser games, and yes, video productions. Time marches on. Meanwhile, flu-ridden kids these days have to squint at endless loops of come dine with me, or complaints to various managers. Dion Dublin helping people sell their houses at auction. At least that one's suit to be feverish. Thank you.